They've already read the scripture I was going to use. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shined. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. I found this on uh, Facebook the other day. If you have that picture up there, Darren, yeah, there we go. It's a fine line between a long sermon and a hostage situation. I'm going to try to keep us on the sermon side of that equation this morning so no one feels like they're kept over time. <clears throat> we know that the Bible is full of prophets and, and prophecies. And every single prophet that has prophesied in the Bible has been accurate to 100%. There's only a few prophecies that have left to be un, uh, that are still unfilled, fulfilled, which is basically the second coming of Christ taking us home. But everything up to that time has been accurate and fulfilled. There is twelve prophets. There was major and minor. They weren't minor because they were under the age of eighteen. They were minor classified because they had less accounts that were shared as opposed to the others. There is, and this is alphabetical order. I didn't realize that some of the names were attached to this like I thought. Amos, Daniel, Ezekiel, Habakkuk, Haggai, Hosea, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Jonah, Joel, Malachi, Micah, Nahum, Obadiah, Zechariah, Zephaniah. They were all appointed by God to be the voice of God to the people of God. Yet Isaiah, as we heard this morning from Tammy, his main job was to foretell the future, specifically the time surrounding the birth of Christ, welcoming the Son of God, the chosen one, the promised Messiah. Now, Isaiah lived approximately 700 years before the birth of Christ. You can take that off the screen now. Thank you. I don't want to be reminded. <laughs> I'm doing the best I can. He was living approximately 700 years before the birth of Christ. Yet his prophecies were 100% accurate, as I said earlier, as all the prophecies of the Bible have been. And not one prophecy has ever failed to be true. To put things in a little bit of a time perspective, sometimes we'll tell our kids, I promise we'll take care of that on Saturday. Maybe it's Tuesday afternoon, and you only have a few days to wait. When I was a young child, I would also often visit my grandmother and grandpa, grandfather, and she would always say, after a while. Grandma, when can we do this? After a while. Well, what does that mean? Whenever we get to it, after a while. Is that in a minute? Is that in an hour? Is that today, tomorrow? After a while. And that would get so frustrating to me because I wanted a time limit on that. I wanted an ending period so I knew what to look for. Most of the time it was the same day. When are we going to have ice cream? After a while. When can I go out and play? After a while. So I learned... <laughs> Not to ask anymore. But there's a time difference. If we promise our son or daughter something, you, know, you can get a new car when you're 16, or we're going to take care of that at Christmas time, or when school starts back, you can get new clothes. There's, there's a time difference. We looked at Noah a few months ago when we talked about the message um, get on board. Um, his prophecy was 100 years in the future, 100 years in the making. Noah talked about the impending devastation via a flood 100 years before it rained. That's a long time to keep saying the same message over and over again. Isaiah talked about the impending salvation via the Messiah 700 years before Christ's reign. I, I can't imagine being a prophet of God. I'm not sure I'd want that job, especially knowing that I'm telling a story that was spoken to me by God himself that has to carry the truth and the validity and the hope and the light for 700 years. That's a very long time. And it wasn't a very simple message. I know that Isaiah was very faithful to God. But first of all, the message was, I'm going to provide salvation. Awesome. Who's the salvation for? All mankind. Anyone who accepts my son. 
What's the salvation going to look like? The birth of my son. Who's your son? His name will become Jesus. It will be above every other name. Okay? So it's not a warrior. It's not a champion. It's not a king. It's a baby. So imagine being Isaiah sitting in his room somewhere, and he's being told that I'm going to provide salvation through a baby, through a virgin named Mary, in a place called Bethlehem, and he's going to be born in a stable. I can't, I can't imagine what's going through Isaiah's mind at this time. How do I have people listen to me to think that I'm actually making sense? That the Messiah is going to come through a child, through a virgin, not through a big town or pompous circumstances, not through a family lineage of importance, not a champion, not a warrior, not a king, but a baby in a manger in a stable in a small town called Bethlehem to a virgin. <clears throat> and it's not going to happen for 700 years. I would be hard-pressed to share that. Because the people living from that moment to the 700th year, they're not going to have a clue. They're not going to be able to experience that. It was just a hope deferred. It was a hope that was going to happen. Now, sometimes we have a hard time living between now and, oh, I'm going to get a bonus a year from now. And we, we already have that money you know, planned out where we're going to spend it on, the new boat or redoing the garage or whatever. <clears throat> And we have to wait that time out with a hope deferred. We're going to do that then. I can't last 700 years to find out about the birth of the Messiah. It would have been very hard, I think, if it were me, if Jesus would have asked me to give this message to last for 700 years and to be accurate in every detail. Isaiah was a very strong man. Isaiah was a very much appreciated and leaned on by the power of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah did his job. And because of that, for 700 years, we knew what to look for when that time came. It was no more questions. Where's he going to come from? How's he going to get here? All those things were answered 700 years ago. <clears throat> there truly is a lot to unpack here, a lot of symbolism, a lot of significance that it could literally take days to go through all that's contained within those few verses. But this morning, I'm going to break down just a couple of key points of substance that I feel will help to remind us of the magnitude of our role as Christians in this world this Christmas. <clears throat> I believe we are remiss to the power of the Holy Spirit when we do not let our light shine. I believe we are going to be held accountable when we get to heaven. When Jesus asks us, did you live for me? Did you let the light that's in you that is my son, did you let him shine through you to help the world around you? What is our answer going to be? Because, you know, it's, well, it's your job, Pastor. You have to do it. Well, I don't have to, but yes, I'd like to, and I should, but so should all of you. Every single person who bowed their hearts and asked Christ to be their Savior, and that light is now within you, it's not for yours to keep. It's not for you alone. It's for every single person who God puts in your place, puts near you, puts in your circle of influence. And I think we have a job to do. As it was in the time of Christ's birth, the Israelites were going through one of their darkest times. The Bible says a deep darkness, and it was due to... Previous rebellion, generations of bad decisions, another season where they walked into darkness because of their bad decisions and the consequences that followed. Yet 700 years prior, Isaiah said the light would shine upon them and that message of the great light would be both literal and figurative. Literal as the bright star. Astronomers and scientists can can prove that at one time there was a star that stood in the heavens for a very long period of time. And that allowed those people from the east who came to Bethlehem, well, it wasn't Bethlehem at the time, 
to find Christ. Remember, we have this lovely white scene of the, uh, the manger, but the, the three kings, the people of the Orient, were not there at the birth of the Christ. They didn't come to almost two and a half years later, and they were no longer in stable, thank the Lord. They found better accommodations by that time. You know, he said, we three kings of Orient are, all we know is they were people that came from the east that were well off and well thought of and very talented and smart. But that bright star was in existence, and that's how they find Christ. Also literal in translation, because the light of the angels appeared in the night sky. When the angels shone, there was light that was around them so much that the shepherds who were in the fields were afraid. And the first things the angel said was, don't be afraid. Behold, I give you good tidings of good joy. This is a message of hope, and here's where you can find the baby. But it was also figurative, because we don't see a baby as light. However, the birth of Jesus became the light of the world. We live in a dark time. We live in deep darkness, and all one has to do is look and listen for a short period of time, and they could quickly and easily ascertain the darkness that surrounds all of us. Society has turned its back on God. It's a time of rebellion and selfish decisions and the consequences that followed. We can plainly recognize evil in the places of prominence throughout every facet of humanity. Nothing is sacred anymore. Nothing has value. And in fact, even to the point where the gift of life is no longer sacred. It's no longer what God had intended. In fact, now a lot of times it is just tossed aside. However, the good news is just as it was in the time when Jesus was born, there is a light that can still shine in the darkness, and it's still the light of Christ. The prophecy was given 700 years before the birth of Christ, and now we're living 2,000 years later with the hope of that light that was still with us, that was born 2,000 years ago. 2,700 years between prophecy, fulfillment, and now living with that hope. As a baby, Jesus represented God's light of love and truth to the world. And that light is the message of hope. And it remains just as powerful today as it was when he was laid in the manger. And it is up to every person who calls himself a Christian to share both the light and the message of hope and love to those in their circles of influence. We need to carry the light of Christ within us so that we can let it shine to the world around us. The old song, This Little Light of Mine, we all learned it when we were young. Christmas is the perfect time for us to be gently reminded that the light of Christ is in all of those who claim to be Christians, who live out Christianity. Remember last week we had the nominal Christian as opposed to the true believer, the difference in what they did. Every true believer has a light of Christ in them. We need to allow the biblical accounts to take up residence in our heart in such a way that those accounts represent what we do and say. I'm very grateful for our first reading. And Tammy said, we picked out the first week because we only have to light one candle. <laughs> but in three weeks, someone's got to light them all. <laughs> but I was grateful for their help, and, and we'll have a couple more coming up. It should be that easy to walk out that door and to let our light shine. Light the candle within you and let it shine to the world around you. Does the world see the light of Christ in your actions and in your words? Does the world hear the words of Jesus when you speak? I get into so many conversations at the drive-thru at Hardee's or Taco Bell 
or when I go to the home goods store or Walmart, which is my home away from home, I get into conversations because I just ask people, how you doing? And a lot of times they look at me like, who are you and why do you care? But I do care. I want to know about their life. And a lot of times I'll say, you know what? I can't fathom that, but I can pray for you because I believe in a God that can answer prayer. I've had people stop and cry at the, the counter. I had one beautiful black veteran who's probably close to 80 years old. He had his Navy cap on and... I walked into the store, and he and his wife were coming out, and he dropped something, and I picked it up for him. And I think he felt a little awkward, a little embarrassed at first. And I put it in his hand, and I said, I want you to know how much I appreciate the sacrifice you made for our nation. And that little man put down what I just gave him. He was shorter than I was and all bent over, and he wrapped his arms around me, and he wept right there at the door of the store. And I said, thank you for your sacrifice. I said, it reminds me of the sacrifice that Christ made for us. And he just pulled away. He said, you're a Christian. And I said, yes. He said, well, I am too, buddy. And we both started crying. <laughs> I want to be a light. I, I want to be a person that is so full of Christ that when we meet and hang out, when you walk away, you feel better for having an encounter, not because of who I am, but because of who Christ is within me. Do the people at your job know that you're a Christian just because you say it or because you live it? Your friends, your neighbors, do they see the light of Christ in you? Does your family recognize the light of Christ within you? Are you allowing that little light to shine? It's important. I'm going to show that next picture, please, Darren. Well, not that one. I'm sorry. We haven't gotten there yet. Yes, there, we, there we go. Madden Langeau. We do not draw people to Christ by loudly discrediting what they believe, by telling them how wrong they are, how right we are, but by showing them a light that is so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. That's evangelism. That's letting Jesus' light shine through you. Man, that's powerful. And we can always be as powerful as the entity that is within us. And we're going to find out in just a minute that he is all-powerful. So if our God who lives within us is all-powerful and his light wants to shine through us, all we got to do is let it happen. Let our actions and our words be whom he is, so that when they see us and hear us, they see and hear him. <clears throat> I am known as Timothy Paul Patrick, Tim Patrick, Tim, Pastor Tim, Christian, preacher, teacher, brother, father, grandfather, uncle, nephew, cousin, percussion instructor, drummer, little drummer boy, not so much anymore, friend, songwriter, arranger, and all these different titles are all pointing back directly to me. It tells you a little bit about who I am. You can hear those titles and figure some of the things that I do. It's very similar to when Isaiah said to Jesus that he would be called Wonderful and Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. All of those names and those titles point directly to Jesus. And it should give us a very good representation of who he is. And how vitally important what he does is for our lives and the lives of others. It should also bolster our willingness and our confidence to share him with people who God strategically places in our lives. Now, he is wonderful. Bing. Excellent, great, marvelous, inspiring delight, definite goodness, or just a few definitions of the word wonderful. One of the word wonderful. How many people in our lives can we appropriately and accurately attribute to being wonderful? Most of you are going to say your spouse. Some of you might say your kids. Many might say their parents. But in reality, in the course of our waking up and going to bed, I doubt there's very many people that we would actually say that is a wonderful person. 
But when using the definitions I just read and with Jesus embodying wonderful and we know who he is within us, why do we not choose to shine for him? Why do we allow his light to be hid under a bushel? This world needs to know who Jesus is because nothing in all of existence can compare to him because he is wonderful. He is counselor. If there was ever a time in human history we needed someone to look up to, it's now. We all need to talk. We all need to open up. We all need someone to confide in who will listen. But with God, not only does he listen, he also gives good advice. Not only does he give good advice, he gives perfect advice, and he gives it every single time we ask for it. We may have to wait, but he will always give it. Jesus knows us better than, he, than, than we know everybody else. Jesus knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows how to give the advice that we need. He can counsel us better than any person at any time. And we can go to him anytime we need counseling, healing, forgiveness, direction. Because Jesus is faithful to listen and he is willing to extend his heart and his hand to his children. Us. He's never too busy. He wants to hear from you. He wants to be involved in your life. Our counselor is ready to receive and is needed today more than ever before. He is mighty God. We often don't attribute the title mighty God to the little tiny child that laid in the manger. Yet he is mighty. And there is nothing our God cannot do. He is omniscient, which means he is all-knowing. He is omnipresent, which means he is at all places at all times. And he is omnipotent. <laughs> Thank you. All powerful. He is perfectly willing and absolutely capable to not just meet our needs, but be able to go far above and beyond anything we can think or imagine. This world truly needs to turn to and rely upon our mighty God. He is everlasting Father. Our Heavenly Father has always been God. He has been God long before there was time. The Bible tells us that he was there at creation. We're also told that he has always been and always will be. He is the God of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Our God is forever, eternal, everlasting, infinite, no beginning, and no end. And as we learned a few months ago, he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. So what a blessing we have knowing that our everlasting Father loves us infinitely and intimately, and he will be with us at every moment of our life. Show that Billy Graham picture real quick. If ever there was a time this country needed the intervention of God, it is now. I have so much respect for Mr. Graham. We need peace. These last few weeks, these last few months with the Middle East and Ukraine and Russia and the border, and it just seems like every time we turn on the TV or turn on our phone, there's, there's more mess, there's more unrest, there's more trouble. We need peace. We need it now. We need God to intervene. This state, this nation, this world needs peace more than ever before. And not merely the appearance or the facsimile of peace, and not just the lack of war or conflict, but true peace. True peace can only come through Christ. It can only come from knowing Jesus. He doesn't offer just give us peace because he is peace embodied. When he came into that manger, peace arrived on this earth that we can hang on to for eternity, that we can hope with, that we can grab onto, that we can use, that we can walk in and live in. He is peace just as the word says. As I presented earlier, the world is full of darkness and in that darkness comes things like sin and strife and anxiety and pain and heartfelt um, wrenching and confusion but thankfully, 1 Corinthians 14 tells us very clearly that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Who among us can stand to have a little bit more peace in our lives? 
This world needs to experience the soul-changing peace that only Jesus provides, sweet and true peace. And because he is our everlasting father, we know that in him we can also experience everlasting peace. John says it this way, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. And Philippians 4 says the peace of God that passes beyond all human understanding is yours. A lot of titles, a lot of names, same person. Why do we hold back? What's more important in our daily life than us sharing the light of hope that's within us? The sacrifices that were made that God allowed his son to come to this earth, that his son tore off the embodiment of royalty and and godliness and put on the flesh and walked this earth for 33 and a half years and was tortured and killed for us so that we wouldn't have to die that death. And then show the power of resurrection and the promise of a future with him in heaven for eternity. And hope. Where, where do we stop sharing that message? Why do we stop sharing that message? Christmas is a very sweet and natural time to be reminded of the message of hope. This Christmas season, I challenge myself, I challenge all of you, I challenge anybody within uh, the hearing of my voice to better shine the light of Christ into a dark world. Just as God needed to present the precious light of his son back then, we also need to present the precious light of his son to those around us. This world is dark. Let's show them the brightness of his light. This world is cold. Let's show them the warmth of his love. Because that's what Christmas is about, Charlie Brown. So in all we do, while we celebrate and decorate and have festivities and fellowship and give and receive gifts, let's make sure to vibrantly live out this message of hope to the world around us. He is wonderful. He is our counselor. He is our mighty God. He is our everlasting father. He is our prince and source of peace. Jesus is our message of hope. And this world needs what he has to offer. Let's allow him to shine through us this Christmas. I'm going to go ahead and close out in prayer. Then we're going to have a a hymn at the end. I think you will really appreciate and. You can stand if you want to. It's, it's a sweet old hymn I think that you really enjoy. But let's pray. God, I know the message is a little shorter than normal. I'm sure people here are happy. <laughs> I did not want to hold them hostage. And even when I get tongue-tied and my, my words don't come out like I want them to, dear God, please don't let the message be hard to grasp. Don't let it be confusing. You've chosen this vessel to use for whatever reason, so I'm trying to be faithful in allowing you to, to speak through me, dear God. So don't let my inadequacies taint your message or let it fall short from what your intention is. God, I love you. Jesus, I love you. The Holy Spirit, I adore you. and I want my life to be one that is so full of your light that when... I approach people feel something different then maybe they can't even explain it there's a warmth there's a joy there's just that something different and when I leave maybe they take a little bit of that with them you said that you're willing that none should perish and sometimes as we walk around this life through Jesus at home or at work or at play that might be the only version of Jesus that they ever see. So help us to let your son's light within us to shine, to warm, to love. Thank you for the birth of your son. Thank you for fulfilling all prophecy. 
thank you for loving us. And it's in your son's name that I pray. Amen.